Well, hello, Faith Harvest Fellowship. Uh, welcome again to Discipling Class. Uh, we're still in Hebrews here. Uh, we'll get right into that. I want to, before we get into that, I do want uh, to uh, ask the Lord to bless our tithes, our offerings, and our time here today with the reading of His Word. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word today. We ask, Lord, that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today. We ask you to bless our tithes and our offerings. We ask you, Lord, we thank you for them. For we know, Father, that uh, your word is free. But getting the word out and providing a place for us to gather, you know, and those uh, who are serving your people, Lord God, it takes resources, it takes finances. And we thank you, Lord God, and we thank you for all of those that are giving so that your word can get out, This the freedom of your gospel can get out. We thank you for that. And we ask you to continue, Lord God, to uh, uh, bless us and bless our jobs, protect our jobs, protect our, uh, our uh, way of life, protect our... Uh, our uh, resources, Father, that you have given us through these hours so that we can not only provide for our families, but that we can also provide for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Going back to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, today we're at uh, uh, verse 23 through 29. We're discussing and talking about Moses. It says, by faith, Moses, you know, uh, in Moses was laid out and he probably talked as much about Moses as he did Abraham because of the, the, uh, the huge role that uh, Moses played in shifting the gospel over to, you know, the next generation. And Moses wrote, you know, these, the first four gospels here, or the, uh, the uh, books, and actually first five in the uh, Old Testament. So uh, there's a lot said about Moses. And I want to highlight on, on, in this program on one specific area. You know, it, uh, it does mention, you know, his mother and father, you know, the faith that they had to hide him, you know, uh, and because he was a beautiful child, it said, by faith, this is actually talking about Moses' mother and father. It says, by faith, when he was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents. It's talking about his parents' faith, you know, in God. Why? Because they knew that he was chosen. And uh, they knew that, that Satan was, uh, you know, through, you know, Pharaoh was trying to, uh, uh, to, to murder all of the children to kill this child, their child. And it said they were, they were not afraid of the king. You know? So they defied the king's orders and hid him. And then it goes on to say in verse 40, or 24, it says, And Moses, when he became age, of age, he refused to call, be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to uh, suffer affliction with his people of God than to enjoy the uh, passing pleasures of sin. It goes on, says 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ. In other words, the gospel, the hope of the coming of the Messiah, you know, esteeming that, seeing that more important than being uh, 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 Lavished with the riches and treasures of Egypt, he says, and he looked forward. He looked past the temptations. He chose this life. You know, I, I look at this message and I, I look at the life of Moses and it, it is really, really uh, encouraging, you know, to, to see because he lived for 40 years. Grew up in Pharaoh's, uh, uh, basically as Pharaoh's, you know, next in line. He could have been next Pharaoh there. And when he became 40 years old, you know, he's on a course right here that seemingly could take him uh, and take God's plan 
for, you know, that, that going back to what I've been talking about, about Abraham and Sarah's family and how God was going to use the Jews, which is his family, to bless the world. It seemingly looked like uh, that this had gone awry, you know, and had been captured and hijacked because here they are now in Egypt as captives. But what we see here is that God had a plan before all of this happened. You know, to preserve a deliverer, which basically in the Old Testament, Moses is referred to as a type of Christ, you know, that led, you know, the children of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, you know, out of bondage, which laid down the, the prototype and the shadow of what Jesus would do for all humanity when he came on the scenes in the New Testament to deliver all mankind, all humanity from uh, an eternal bondage in hell, separated from God who loved them. And so Moses basically uh, was a picture of what Moses was going to do in his life, of what Jesus would do physically, from, uh, physically and spiritually uh, once he got finished uh, fulfilling his uh, call. But we see here as it goes on, it says, And by faith Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the king, although, you know, he had a lot to fear. He said, uh, but he was looking for that invisible, going back to what Abraham did, looking for that invisible city. It says, uh, uh, seeking him who is invisible. Moses started seeking God. He had a passion to find out from God. Once he realized, once God showed him at 40 years old that he was not an Egyptian, that he was a Hebrew. He was from the lineage of Abraham. Now listen, he grew up as Hebrews being slaves. Hebrews, and I'm sure he played with some Hebrews children, you know, uh, you know it, uh, it was hidden from him, but his adopted mother, which was Pharaoh's daughter, knew that he was Hebrew, and she kept it from everybody. Her servants kept it from everybody, but it could not be hidden. Forty years old, God began to visit him. Now, we don't know how... Uh, totally how it happened, but Moses uh, uh, discovered that he was a Hebrew, and his, his adopted mother begged him, look, nobody knows about this. Keep it quiet, you know, and you'll be the next in line for, for the, to be the Pharaoh. You will have the whole world at your feet. But Moses had this inner drawing. That's kind of like you and I when we first got uh, when we were first brought into this world. We were brought into a world of deception. You know, uh, we had been hijacked, you know, and uh, uh, we were in a culture that we really didn't belong in. We didn't belong in this world. We don't belong in, you know, it, we were never meant to, to, to grow up in this uh, uh, God never purposed us to grow up into this culture that we're in, this cursed culture. You know, Adam and Eve was in a supernatural environment that God wanted to, 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 to develop throughout the whole world. But because they uh, failed to sin and uh, forfeited it, you and I were forced to grow up into this cursed culture. But we were not purposed to be here. We didn't even know it until we got a certain age. And many of us, I don't know when it was for you, but I know when, when I was a young you know, teenager, I began to say, what is life all about? I don't know, you know, uh, there got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing here. I did not know, but that the Lord was beginning to set me up for a visitation with him. And I won't get into it, uh, or I'll get off track here. But once I, once he, uh, we had that uh, visitation, and I met him for the first time. I knew I I didn't know anything about him. This word right here, 
I was told was the Bible. I knew that all my life, you know, about the Bible. We never, we never went to church. My mother and father, my grandmother and grandfathers, they never went to church. You know, we, you know, basically, you know, uh, we didn't know anything about God other than what we would hear on, you know, TV. You know, I knew that of the Bible, but I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about God. And when I first met him, I was given a Bible and said, this is the, the, uh, the word of God. This is the infallible written word of God you know, to us, and it's the hope of life. Well, I just believed it. I chose to believe it because I, when I was introduced to him and I got a glimpse of him, I recognized that there was something different. And I saw hope in my life when before I had no hope. I had no joy. I was an angry uh, person. But when I met Jesus for the first time, I recognized him as my hero, uh, as my only way to have a peaceful end to this journey. And I began to chase him. But every word that was in this Bible when I first met him, to me, was basically uh, theory. It had not been tested. It had not been proven. And, uh, but when I gave my life to the Lord, the very first promise, you know, once something has been proven to you, then no longer is it theory. It's truth. And I was told in this word that in, uh, he, uh, in uh, John chapter uh, 14, verse 27, it says, you and I have been given peace. He said, I give you peace, not as the world giveth, but my peace I give you. It's the kind of peace that if the world hates you like they hate me, this peace will be there. This is what he was saying. This peace will be there to keep you calm, to keep you from panicking. Well, when I gave my life to Jesus that night, I experienced that peace. That theory was no longer a theory to me. It became truth because I experienced it. And throughout my whole life, I've been serving the Lord now 50 years. I can tell you for 50 years, everything that he has promised in here, I have seen lived out in my life. Now, there are many promises in here that have not yet come to, to fruition yet. You know, I've not experienced all the promises, but I've experienced so many promises in here that, that God said would happen in my life. Like it said, Deuteronomy, you know, uh, uh, 20, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 12 says that, you know, God said, I put before you a blessing and a curse. And then in chapter 27, 28, it tells you, here are the blessings. And if you do these things, your life will be blessed. If you do these things, which are the curse, your life will be cursed. So if we keep doing the good thing that God calls blessed, that will bring blessing, eventually your life will, will receive good and it will receive a blessing. But if you go knowing what it says, warning us not to do these things, for they will bring you a curse. You keep doing these things that it says will bring a curse. The end of the matter, the end of your life, the end of things is going to be cursed. And this is what we deal with here today in our culture today. Because we in America have been doing the things that God said are a curse. And is it any wonder we have done them for so long that now our nation is living under a curse? Now, we are born again Christians and our lives are not cursed. It says, for we are born again and we've been set free from the curse. But make no mistake about it. Our lives are influenced by the cursed world that we're living in today. We ha have to have the Word of God. And if we, even though we live in a cursed world, even those, those around us that are still living and doing the things that bring the curse, their lives will be cursed. And our government doing things that are cursed, causing our nation to be cursed, you and I, if we return back to doing the things that bring the blessing, it will, our lives will be blessed. 
our children's lives and our, our family's lives will be blessed. We have to stay focused. I like to say it this way. The Bible just did, didn't tell us what did happen. It tells us what always happens. What will always happen if you do the things that are blessed, your life will be blessed. Always. Doesn't matter what season you're in. Doesn't matter what generation you're in. Same thing with the curse. If you do what it said was the curse, your life will always be plagued with curses. So looking at Moses' life, he said, I don't want to live this lie no more. I, his eyes were opened up to his plan. Every one of us at some point in our life are going to have our eyes opened up to the plan of God, the whole plan of God. And then he'll open us, if you do, listen, this verse up here, I love this uh, uh, verse here, verse 26. It said that Moses esteemed it, meaning that he, he recognized it was more important for him to find out about his plan that Christ had for his life, which basically the reproach of Christ, meaning he knew that if he goes back and becomes a, if he goes back to his family, now he realizes where he's from, that he was going to have to suffer now like they did. Meaning, like Christ suffered. You know, Christ had to suffer, you know, uh, the, the uh, whole of the humanity's uh, sin. He had to suffer the crucifixion. He had to suffer the persecution and everything. But he said, that to me is more important to even if I've got to suffer all of this. Now, we're talking about somebody that has been pampered all their life. Somebody that probably didn't really have a lot of scars on his hands or calluses. You know, now, it did say that he was uh, taught, you know, in warfare. You know, he was a very good uh, fighter. He was a very good, you know, uh, you know uh, basically uh, general, so to speak. Uh, but chances are he didn't have a lot of calluses on his hands. He knew the hardship because his family put hardship upon the Jews all of his growed up years. So he knew what he was going back to. He said, but he looked forward. He looking past all of the pleasures he could have had in Egypt and he was looking forward to the reward. You know, uh, looked to the reward and it says, forsaking Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, for, for his endurance, seeing, seeking him, one translation says, seeking him who is invisible, seeking God. He kept pressing forward. I want to encourage you. Faith gives us the strength to choose God's will and plan for our lives. You know, instead of our plan. I know us in America, if anybody can relate to this place of pleasure, it's every born, every born again American citizen. Listen, America has enjoyed a time of peace and a time of prosperity unlike any other uh, people in the world for some 6,000 years. Because America's 247 years old, you know, and uh, uh, we have seen in our time, even though we have seen America's struggles, we still have not seen the kind, especially in my life, we have not seen the kind of persecution that our brothers and sisters in other countries have experienced for serving the Lord. The book of Hebrews was written to encourage people who were being martyred, who were being murdered, and then children being adopted and kidnapped and used for human torches simply because they were Christians. They were being persecuted on every end. As we go through even more challenging times that were in our lives today, we need to go back to the book of Hebrews because it tells us how to choose God's plan in spite of the threats, in spite of the persecution, in spite of, you know, uh, the, the uh, price 
uh, hard price that we would have to pay, the sufferings uh, that we would have to, to endure simply because we claim to be Christians. Listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ, your faith and my faith, right now in America, in America's uh, uh, halls and chambers of government from the local level all the way up to the federal level are not tolerated at all. I didn't say we didn't have some people in these areas that believe the Lord, but the people, are, the Christian brothers and sisters that are in governmental positions that are trying to live out their faith are living it out under the, under the persecution, under the, the, the mockings and, and uh, uh, penalties of their faith. And if they continue to live out their faith, like I said, it, uh, they're not tolerated in, in these areas. We don't see it tolerated in our schools anymore. Whether it's from kindergarten all the way up to higher education. We don't see it in, in the hospitals. You know, uh, I was sitting in a doctor's office. And I heard uh, somebody, you know, w w talking about, they were talking about, you know, Jesus. And the one lady opened up the, the, the do window and said, listen, we, we, don't, we don't use uh, the name of Jesus in here. This is in the medical professions we're in. Public, if we're out in the public and we're talking about Jesus Christ, it's considered hate speech. You and I have to choose like Moses did, whether it's going to be hardship upon us or not. We can learn from Moses. Faith gives us strength to choose and to stay the course to do God's will for our life. We see it through his whole life and all of the challenges knowing that, and that God uh, did promise him a lot of things and many of those promises he brought to pass. But there were some of the promises that he did not get to see. He did not get to go into the promised land. He did not even get to see the promised land in this life, but he got to see it in the life eternal. Now, I'm encouraging us today because I know uh, the, uh, uh, I've, I have been the brunt of uh, persecutions. Any minister today who is standing upon the word of God and is standing against the political correctness, you know, standing against, you know, uh, things that are, uh, that are just, uh, uh, human, humanly wrong and an abomination, you know, uh, like this transgender uh, initiative. This is a lie. It is a lie that we all, every one of us know, even those that are pushing this issue know inside of them this is not right. They're using many of these people who are unfortunately caught up in, the, in, in this uh, uh, deception. They're using their pain, using their suffering to further an agenda, to continue to bring confusion and chaos so that they can continue uh, to drive the wedge in this country. You and I, as believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we take a stand on this. You see, there is a demonic spirit that the Bible says in the last days that you and I are going to have to uh, uh, deal with, and it's called deception. Jesus said it in the 24th chapter of Matthew, 21st chapter of Luke. It says in the last days uh, that deception will be so great that if God did not shorten the days, if the Lord didn't shorten the times here, that everybody would be deceived. And uh, this is what we see today. It is going to take us choosing the road that God called us to take. Even if it means suffering persecution. Even if it means great sufferings. You know, we've had ministers in this country 
through, you know, uh, uh, the last four years that have had to go to jail simply because they wouldn't close their churches now. And that was a suffering. But this is what God has called us into. If this is the time that we've been born, God has equipped each one of us to face the challenges and the fears of the things that we're going through. Knowing that our hope is in Jesus Christ. He will provide for us. He'll provide first and foremost peace. Moses had a peace. And he had a longing. The harder it gets, the harder Moses' life was, the more in focused he got on searching for this invisible God that spoke to him. I want to tell you, the more difficult your life gets. And the Bible tells us in the last days that it's going to be so difficult. Your, you and I living our faith, you and I fulfilling God's word, preaching and ministering His gospel, is going to get so hard, people are not going to listen to us. Being able to, uh, 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 it will take the spirit of the living God to save people because they will refuse to endure sound doctrine. Meaning our job is going to be a lot harder. Our job to live our faith in, in front of the world that we're in. Even with many of our family members. You know, there are some, fa some family members that you, you, you're going to go over to and they're going to say, I don't want to hear about that Jesus of yours. You know, we're going to have to rely on the spirit of the living God. And my prayer to you today, seek God's spirit to be one. The closer and the harder that Moses' job got, the more intense. It's like he put on these blinders so that he wouldn't be distracted from the left or right, so that he can seek that invisible God that spoke to him. You have the invisible God living inside you, the Holy Spirit. You need to become one with him now. Get into, you know, uh, uh, Paul's writings into Corinthians and discover the gifts uh, uh, that God gave, you know, uh, us to, to become intimate with his spirit that lives in us. You're going to need to become one with God's spirit. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know, listen, it's talking first and foremost about you and me, me being one with God's Spirit, being able to hear His Spirit. If we are not one with God's Spirit, and the only way we can be one with God's Spirit is to use His Word, the things He has revealed in the Bible, so that we can continue to do the things that said would bless us. And so that we can avoid doing the things that, that uh, would bring us a curse. We do these things and we will be able to walk one with His Spirit. The, the number one reward that we will get is the very thing you need now. And that our nation needs and that the body of Christ needs right now. And that is the peace of God to reside in our heart. So that number one, that we could be at peace with His Spirit, not being terrified by the spirit of fear in this world, by the spirit of uh, war in this world, the spirit of anger in this world, but that if we're one with His Spirit, our spirit will be calmed down by the peace of God that resides in us. And then in doing that, we can become the peacemaker to the world. It's what it says in the fifth chapter of Matthew. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> you and I are the peacemaker. <clears throat> the peace of God is going to keep us from getting caught up into all of the trauma and the drama and the emotional uh, 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 acclif or uh, <laughs> that's not the word that I'm thinking of, but all of the emotional drama uh, that Everybody's getting caught up in, like the fear, the anger. Right now, there's a spirit of war. There's a spirit of anger. There is a spirit of lawlessness. There is a spirit of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, fear. 
if we have the peace of God in our hearts, the peace of God's going to say, I know that you got that phone call and you are scared to death, but be at peace. That spirit of peace will give you the, the calmness to look at all of these things that are scary that we're dealing with. And then if we look at it in calmness, then we can hear the spirit that is in us because we're one with him. And he is going to be able to lead us through the pitfalls. So that not only are we going to get through it, but we're going to thrive through it like Daniel did in captivity. We will thrive through this. And not only are we going to be able to get through it, we're going to help our families get through it. And then we're going to be able to help all of those that are looking for hope to get through this. God promised this to you and me. This is not something that, that he uh, 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 just arbitrarily threw out there. This is his promise. It said that the spirit of the living God that lives in us will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. <coughs> he will convict your heart of sin, convict your heart of righteousness, convict your heart of justice, meaning that he will show you what's right and wrong. He will show you, and that's how we're going to get through this. But you've got to choose faith. You say, God, I'm going to trust. I'm going to believe in all the stuff that you've already revealed. And I'm going to trust in the promises that I can't see yet. That's what faith is. And the Bible tells us, Deuteronomy 29, 29, says that the, the things that are revealed, which is all of God's word, uh, is revealed are for you and I and for our uh, uh, children's children's children, the next generations, for us to learn, take advantage of, and to do, to be obedient to. That's what I tell you today. That's what faith does. So thank you for watching today. Next week we'll have another program. Know that I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. Godspeed.